Oh, hey guys, you have caught me in an awkward moment. Yeah, not one of those awkward moments, just a regular awkward moment. Erase, erase, erase. So, what is the awkward moment about? Well, my shop is tore up from the floor up. I cannot film in the shed. I know, anyway, just go with it, okay? Um, I am rearranging everything. I've had so many demands. Show us your shed. Tell us what it's made out of. Show me your setup. Yeah, the guitar setup. Yeah, stay on track. Anyway, the machines, the parts, the materials, how it's arranged, and what the workflow looks like as I'm flipping back and forth between coffee cans and cigar boxes and license plates and arch tops and kits. What does that all look like? So that's what I'm up to. So um, I've got some footage that I've built up and I've got an episode in a series that I'm going to start doing called Too Good to Junk Pile. Too Good to Junk Pile. So you run across these guitars. They're too nice to do what I do. So um, this episode is stacked full of stars and it's still that way even if I'm not in it. So before we start, well we already did, but anyway, before we start, yeah, I've got glass on. Don't I look intelligent with these on? <laughs> Joke's on you. Anyway, let's give you some background here. Do you know what a cutaway is? If you don't, just lie, pretend you do, shake your head, yeah, 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 I see you, I see you, good, good. And live in ignorance for the rest of your life. Okay, so what is a cutaway? A cutaway is, you see this can, silver tone Kentucky blue, do not covet it. There is no part cutaway here, cutaway, cutaway, get it? So what cutaways do is they allow you to get down further onto the fingerboard for the higher notes with a slide or picking without going like this. So, you'll see them on arch tops, you'll see them on what they call jazz boxes, that's the kind of guitar that I ruin, an arch top. Anyway, do I have any examples? Of course I do. There are two kinds of cutaways, count them two. First off, Let's look at, well, there's actually three. Again, starting with no cutaway. Is that, is that a type? I guess so. So this is, I think, what they call a Venetian cutaway. You see that? It's smooth, but it allows you, yeah, this is Bob the Junk Pile Arch Top. Link to an episode on how this was built right up there, right about now. But it allows you to get down deeper up here like so, Venetian cutaway. You see these on like Gibson Super 400, okay? Then there is what we call a Florentine cutaway. See that? We can get way down in here on this. Oh, by the way, this is a Dean Palomino model. This is a nice guitar. These Florentine cutaways, we know them to be on Gibson ES-175s, uh, the Mississippi Mudslide, and Lafty the Junk Pile Arch Top. They were Florentine cutaways, the kit guitars I did. I'll give you a link to one of the episodes right up there, right about now. Typically, this is what you'll see in terms of cutaways, or you might even have a double cutaway and then we're into uh, solid bodies and semi hollow bodies and stuff and I don't mess with any of that kind of stuff. So this will be on the test. No cutaway, Florentine cutaway, and Venetian cutaway. Got that? Okay. Let me put this stuff away. We'll be right back. There, that didn't take long, did it? So what's this episode all about? Well, it's called the case of the Phony Florentine Cutaway. Now, before I show you the victim or the subject, or whatever you want to call it, 
I want to talk to you a little bit about a topic I've talked to you before. If my feeble old man memory can remember what episode it was, I'll give you a link up there. But we have talked about John D'Angelico and Jimmy D. Quisto. Now, I talked to you about a book called Acquired of the Angels, Aquisto, D'Angelico. Uh, this is about Luthier's John D'Angelico, who basically traced out a couple of Gibsons in the 30s and built arch tops. And then later on in his life, uh, Jimmy D'Aquisto came along and um, became his apprentice. And then after John D'Angelico died, Jimmy DeQuisto took over and continued until he died. And then you had certain people that were influenced by Jimmy DeQuisto, including Linda Manzer and Ken Parker, most notably, possibly. So anyway, I don't know if I've shared this with you. I think I have by some odd circumstance. I have these guitar sides that are purported and I really believe it, to have come, I know they come out of Jimmy DeQuisto's shop, but the story is such that these came from John D'Angelico's shop. Now, if you read this book, uh, there is a story in here that basically tells you it was miraculous that Jimmy DeQuisto would have these because there was attorneys involved and people taking stuff and repossessing stuff or whatever. But prized possessions. I had another set sent them off to some one. It would be nice if you'd say hi pretty soon and do a little episode about that or something. Anyway, skipping by that. So, this is a D'Angelico XL. Very, very ornate. This is not an original D'Angelico. This is a redo um, done uh, within the past, say, 10 years. Um, but it has uh, Grover Imperial with stair-step tuners. It's got a serial number. It's got all kinds of inlay. Uh, it is a beautiful guitar. So, what is this episode about? Well, here's the deal. If you Google or use any search engine you want and type in D'Angelico XL or New Yorker, you will find guitars going back to the 30s all the way forward. Um, and you will find even guitars that look like this. You may even be able to buy one like this, but you will find some that have no cutaway and you will find some that have Venetian cutaways, but you will never, ever, not even once, find one with a, look at how that fits in there, that's cool, huh? A Florentine cutaway on a D'Angelico guitar. But yet you're looking at one. So, once that donkey's brain, I think he knows the story. I think he's accusing me of lying. And uh, anyway, he, keep your opinion to yourself, donkey. Anyway, so I'm going to tell you a story about this guitar. And there's going to be a lot of people in this episode. There's going to be luthiers that you know and love. There's going to be musicians that you know and love. Maybe one you haven't met before. But I took this guitar after I got it and just went out to people and handed it to them. Some of them played it. Some of them just looked at it. And then I kind of broke the story to him. So get some popcorn. This episode is going to be very, very interesting. And um, I'm going to jump in between people and kind of tell you the context of what to expect and a little bit about who they are. So let's start with how I found this guitar. Well, first off, this kind of thing, my search engines... I don't have them set for D'Angelico's because the last thing I'm going to do, or your high-end Gibsons, the last thing I'm going to do is take one of these and do what I do. I don't play guitar well, so having these around, it does me nothing. 
yet I still have a few guitars that are nice. Um, to be really honest with you, I can take this guitar if I run across the shop that has four, five old junky arch tops that I want, I can just trade this off and it's good trading stock. Anyway, so this pops up on Marketplace one morning and I look at it and I know what these things are worth. I can look up um, what the uh, what the price of the remakes are because they started showing up uh, in the uh, like I said the last 10 years and um, some of them are cheaper than others some of them with double pickups you get up around 22 2500 up to three thousand dollars but um, they weren't made in John D'Angelico's shop in New York City that is for sure so they're subbed out somewhere and we're going to touch on that in a little bit with some questions I have with one of the luthiers about how you would get something unique like this. Yeah, unique up on it. Anyway, so my alarm goes up, ring, and uh, I see it and I can't believe the price. And I look at all the pictures and I don't know enough about these guitars because again, I don't dabble in them. And um, it says custom modification. So I start doing my, my uh, research, looking on the internet, looking in the books I have, and um, I can't find one of these. And so I immediately get a hold of the person, start asking a few questions, and it comes up that this is the modification that is being talked about in the ad. So we go back and forth. I let, leave it sit for a bit. It's not moving. I make an offer. We go back and forth. And finally, I drive down. Where is it? I'm looking for it. You know what I'm looking for. Be right back. All right, I'm quick on those breakaways to get the props that I was ill-prepared for. So I make arrangements to meet this person in a parking lot in Northridge, California, cultural capital world, at the college there. And you'll never guess the number lot. Yes, it was B4. B4. You all know B4. B4 comes before after. Okay, so I get there. Nice case. Opens it up. And you're going to hear more of the story along the way. But he walks up. Not drives up. Comes around the corner carrying the case, opens the case, and this is inside. And um, it's beautiful. Um, there is so much work on the fretboard, fingernail marks. And you're gonna hear about that a little bit from one of the luthiers, but I said, I can't find anyone with this one on. And that's where the mystery started, he says, I'm a musician. I play Latin jazz music. This thing came with a Venetian cutaway, and I wanted to be able to get down in here to work these lower frets. And I'm a professional musician. Um, a professor at the college in San Diego where I went told me about this person, and this person did this modification. In other words, took this from being a Venetian cutaway to a Florentine cutaway and did the work for $300 and says to me you're getting a good deal because the price you're paying 300 of that is for this work. Now you're going to see as we go through the episode there's some questions and some intrepidation about this whole story. So guess what I did? The first thing I did was go to the one that we all go to when we really want to know what's going on because he's been around forever. I took it, never said a word, just I want to see you, Fred. Showed up, put the case on his bench. And Fred always opens up a case and he looks at things before he says anything. And then I pop the news on him about 
this and how it supposedly got here. So, without further ado, let's see what Fred had to say. So what do we got? Somebody's, somebody's played this a lot. So, Fred, what if I told you that this guitar did not come with a Florentine cutaway? Let me pull this out of the way now. Well, in other words, they make a model without a Florentine cutaway. Right, but this one was made, I mean, to be a Florentine cutaway, right? No. Really? How do you know that? Because the person who had the guitar, you can tell from the finger wear on the very lower parts that run the 20, 22nd fret, that he's playing Latin jazz guitar with it, and he could not get to it. So he took it to someone he knew, and they converted this thing to have a Florentine cutaway. Well, we need to know who that guy is that he took it to. I mean, my, just my opinion. I'm looking at the... Uh, I'm looking at the uh, uh, agent to the binding and stuff. Absolutely. No, no, that's... This was made like that, I'm positive. There's no reason why this guy is not going to give up who did the work. There's no reason. I mean, what would be the reason? In other words, if, if a guy does this kind of work, I can get him so much work out of him. So, when I, when I got this guitar, I looked at it and thought, who could do that kind of work? Number one, who would tie into a guitar and want to do that kind of work? And he said he paid $300 to have it done. I'm telling you, man, this was made this way. I mean, tell him you'll give him that I'll pay him a couple hundred bucks if he'll tell me. Who did it? So you would say that if someone could do this work like this and make it look that good, their craftsmanship is... Off the charts. Totally off the charts. Yeah. And I know the capabilities of... I mean, yeah, the whoever it was was a good guitar player. And they pressed entirely too hard, but they were a good guitar player. It'd be much faster if they would, yeah, if they would not press this hard, because the release time, the release when you press this hard gets slowed down. It's time for me to get a hold of the Angelico factory and find out <laughs> what's going on. I can't find it anywhere. I can't find where they ever made a model like this is, is my issue. Everything about it makes sense except that cutaway. I was looking close at the purfling and everything, thinking there's got to be some sign. 
you know, if it's something janky, I would, this guy, is he in L.A. or San Diego? Yeah, he's he goes back and forth. He's He says he's a professional student um, or a professional musician that he, uh, his college professor down at San Diego when he was going to college there introduced him to the person who made this modification. Well, let's find out who it is. Oh, I, I, I asked him two or three times. He's like, maybe someday I'll tell you. I don't. No. <laughs> you know why I brought this to you, right? Uh, no way. No way. Fred, let me ask you this. If you were going to attempt to do this to a guitar, how would you even do that and make the cuts? Well, you, you know, you, 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 once the guitar is made, you know, uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's impossible to, to be able to do this. Um, um, you know, uh, the Harbor Freight has a camera for looking at engines. And it's got a light on it, and it's got a little screen, you know. You look in there, it's going to be all totally perfect. I already did that because I think I have exactly the camera you're talking about because most of them won't fit in the F-holes. Yeah, yeah. The curfing was the tip giveaway. If there's no curfing there, then I could see, but... I don't understand how someone would, would literally, how you would cut that it, it, without collapsing something, cracking something, seeing what's in the finish looks perfect. Next question. Given that this guitar retail value in 2019 was somewhere between $2,100 and $2,500, I don't think I'd want to make that kind of a, repair on something like that. I mean, if the guy charged 300 bucks, yes. But there's no way that anybody is going to do a repair is going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to do this. So you wouldn't do this for $300? If you asked me to do it for $3,000, I wouldn't do it because I wouldn't want to embarrass myself. There's just no way you could work that clean. I'm sorry, it ain't happening. It had to be made this way. There's no way other way. <laughs> Fred has spoken. I'll bet any amount of money. Yeah, I still got my slide on, for what, I don't know. But, you know what? That didn't sound real promising, did it? Thanks, Fred. As always, thank you. So, I decided I'm going to bring the next person into it, and I'm fortunate enough to live around Los Angeles, and there are all kinds of musicians here, um, some in L.A., some in Ventura, and um, I decided to get a hold of our friend Bill Bates. I'm not sure you've met Bill yet, but you're about to. Bill is a journeyman guitarist. He can play a rock. And I was about to hand him one, so I went down to the Escondite in uh, downtown Los Angeles, uh, California Cultural Capital Row. It is literally on Skid Row. And uh, got there late, and the band that Bill was supporting that night is a Chicago blues band, and I handed it to him, never did anything to the guitar. Remember, Fred has told you, this guitar was played extensively, the fingerboard showed that, um, and it was played by a good player, but as we move into the next luthier, after 
Bill Bates does his thing with it, we're going to see a little bit more. The story gets a little bit crazier and deeper. But went to the Eskendite, handed it up. Bill plugs it in and goes to town, and you can tell that the setup on it isn't right. Anyway, Bill runs through it, hands it back to me, gives me a couple pointers, and that'll take us to its next stop. But let's see what Bill did with this thing right out of the right out of the case, the way I got it. Alright guys, that was Bill Bates playing with the Rob Stone Blues Band. I'm going to give you a link to the Rob Stone Blues Band below. And let's see if we can find something they did without a guitar that wasn't intonated properly with the right strings on it. <laughs> but love you, Bill Bates. Thanks for giving us a whirl. So then, I... Still don't learn. I take it off next to somebody that you all have seen before on this channel, Frank Goldwasser. So Frank flew in from uh, France. He's over there uh, sometimes. He comes back to the United States. He does um, guitar um, workshops with some other musicians, both in the L.A. area and then down in Mississippi. They go down in Mississippi once a year. Uh, in fact, Frank is now doing lessons that you can see. I'll give you a link below and try to give you a card up there. Um, and um, I think the first lesson was doing some John Lee Hook or something or other that I can't do. Anyway, so Frank is doing a solo um, gig at NAMBA uh, Arts in Ventura, California, Cultural Capital World. I think I should give you a link down below in resources to NAMBA. You're going to like that if you live in California. They have all kinds of bands of different people and artists coming. Anyway, hand it off to Frank. Frank can play a rock. You'll see Frank kind of looking at it going, what, what's going on here? And he's got somebody with a harmonica in the background that's kind of covering for the deficits of this thing. But by now, we're starting to figure out. Remember, Fred says whoever played this was a very accomplished player. But yet it's got the wrong strings on it, especially the fourth string. It's got a straight string when it when it should be a wound string, and that was that's what was causing the intonation problem. I ended up having somebody set it up and clean it up, and we'll get to that once we see Frank give this thing a whirl.
right, thank you, Frank. Um, luckily, there was a harmonica player covering things in the background, but yeah, something wasn't making sense. You had somebody that had used the fingerboard extensively, as Fred said, and um, um, but yet, when I talked to Frank after he was done playing, he had his comments, and it was like, yeah, the strings aren't right. Something's up with the intonation. And um, and that's when I decided we're going to go see somebody that we all know and love on this channel. And that's Rob at Guitar 48. Rob, um, I go there on Friday night sometimes and go see him. And I'll bring a case in and just set it down and he'll open it. He has no idea what I'm going to put in, and you'll see at the beginning of this clip, he says, it's one of KP's Friday night specials. So, uh, let's take a look at what Rob has to say about this thing. Very interesting. EF's Friday night guitar. Here you go, everybody. Whoa, look at that. Looks like we have, oh my goodness, we have a D'Angelico. Isn't that, oh my goodness, isn't that pretty? Look at this. My goodness, where did you find this one? Okay, well, of course, this, this is not a um, $100,000 D'Angelico. You're aware of that, right? It's a gorgeous guitar. So these guys make some of the nicest sort of uh, modern-day arch top guitars that you can that a, a normal guy could afford it's a beautiful shape it's a beautiful copy of a d'angelico they're modeling this as xl and here you got your tone and volume on the pick guard no holes in this guitar you see that pick guards mounted here on the end of the fingerboard oh yeah can i use that uh, i could probably probably everyone will see the the uh the pick pick up a little better with a <laughs> with a pointer but uh, yeah, this is a beautiful jazz piece, man. Um, yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Big lower bout. Pretty fancy uh, inlays on the headstock. Want me to measure that and see what that is? So it looks like uh, 17 inches. That's what we got on the lower bout. This is the kind of thing that a serious jazz player would like to have and uh, a guy you can't afford a an old Gibson. Nobody can afford the old D'Angelicos. They're, they're museum pieces. Uh, the guy who can't afford an old Gibson is going to be shopping for something like this or maybe a uh, maybe an Ibanez. Make some really nice arch tops that are affordable. Um, there's not a lot on the market so this is a style from a day gone by you know. This is a 2016. This is spruce top. Maple. See the flame maple? Maple back and sides. Uh, tobacco sunburst. This is an interesting label. <laughs> I don't recognize that. Crafted in Incheon. What is that? Yeah, we'll look that up. <laughs> And I'm pretty good with maps, so I don't know that one. Uh, but uh, yeah, 2000, looking like it's a 2016. Looking out the fingerboard, and uh, you can see that somebody's played the heck out of this guitar because you can see, you can see the dirt all the way up to the very top of the cutaway here. So this was a, this guitar was played or practiced on extensively, and you can see the wear and the frets too. So it, it's got some worn frets, but. It's ready for a fret dressing. It's very thick frets. It doesn't have to be replaced. It can be, it can be leveled and crowned again. So this can be made to play just like new again. Well, whoever played the heck out of this thing is using the wrong gauge of strings on it. I don't know if that, that came from your shop, but I doubt it. And so uh, a, a real someone who would really play a guitar like this would have much heavier gauge strings, and they these are like. This bridge is not even intonated for a plain G string like this. You need to have a wound string there. And the, typically this would be set up with pretty heavy gauge flat wound strings and this is in the style of Joe Pass or Barney Kessel or that whole era of jazz. Rob, what if I were to tell you that I called D'Angelico in New York City yeah. 
had them trace that label. They confirmed what you said. The guitar was made in 2016, but the D'Angelico never, including all the original high dollar ones, and the copies of them never came out with a Florentine cutaway. Mm. And it's claimed that that cutaway that's on there now, the Florentine cutaway, was not what came out of the factory. And that somebody in the San Diego area named Angel put that cutaway on there, that Florentine, mm. for $300. Respond to that. Mm. That's what D'Angelico told you? Yeah, D'Angelico told me at the factory, this guitar came yeah. with a different cutaway. And the story is, I got this from this guy, said, oh no, this was done on the street for $300. On the street. Well, I can see some evidence of something here. I don't know if that, this would be extremely hard to, something to do in <laughs> retrospect. Okay, so... Um, uh, I'd have to examine the guitar to say absolutely not, but I'd say it's highly unlikely that this was ever modified. Um, if it was, uh, they did a pretty good job, but I think that's probably just actually a difference in the, the how the lacquer is hardened as it gets close to the... Yeah, I'd say it's really unlikely this was modified. You couldn't find a picture of this anywhere online with a... Oh, there's a million pictures. Yeah. But D'Angelico is telling me they never made it that way. It never okay. left the factory that way. So it only... Let me go here with you, Rob. Whoever... This could possibly be done by someone that's really skilled, but not for $300. Rob, let's go here now. Let's say I brought this in, knowing that it's not an original, knowing that I could have bought the guitar for somewhere between... $1,900 and $2,200 new. And I brought this in and I had dropped it. There was a mar up there. And I said, right. Rob, do a Florentine cutaway on this. Would you even attempt it? And if so, what kind of money or man hours are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, we probably would not. Ne we would never attempt to modify a guitar like that after. You know, this is not something you build after a guitar is constructed. It's something that's done uh, yeah, this, as the guitar is laid out in the new construction. You don't add cutouts to a guitar after they're built. But I'm not saying it's impossible. I just I can't imagine anybody agreeing to do it. I see how this has got a little bit of different uh, something there. But you don't go in in retrospect and do that. I can't see the sides there. Let's see that. Well, that is maple and that is not. So this piece of wood is not maple, this piece of wood, and this back, the rest of the sides is maple. So I guess it's possible. Uh, never happened for $300, as I could see. <laughs> you can send that guy to work for me if you find him. Well, no, they, they, they're saying that this, this, maybe this thing had had a Venetian cutaway and was modified to have a Florentine cutaway. That this would be more in the style of an ES-175. I, I found up about Incheon is a city in Korea. So instead of saying made in Korea, which maybe in 2016 people didn't want to see that on their guitar, that's the name of the city in Korea where the factory is that built this guitar. So it says made in Incheon, Korea. but. Let's say that I knew the factory this was made at. Yeah. And let's say I just called them up and said, Yeah. I want D'Angelico neck. Yeah. I want the body, but I need it put on a Florentine cutaway. Is that at all possible that I could order a guitar like that? No. You can't call that factory and order guitars. Uh, somebody that orders... A hundred guitars or two hundred guitars or a thousand guitars can call them and say and spec out a guitar, but you can't call them and get anything. So how many of these were made roughly this year? Well, I'm just look, looking at this. You can usually get a rough idea. This thing has a serial number. So S1600 and then it says 60591. So maybe they made this model, like you could maybe this particular model maxed out at, who knows, on this, right, this one's 
within the first thousand, but they might have made a thousand of these, they might have made two thousand of these. So if somebody were to order a significant number enough to get the factory to make them, number one, it yeah. would be preferable to the factory if it were actually D'Angelico, yeah. so we're not forging things. Well, and it's not would, a forgery, it's, the, it's commissioned yeah. by whoever owns this name. So for somebody to end up with five or six of these on the street, yeah. Doesn't make any sense. There would be another one somewhere else showing up somewhere. Yes, if this was ever in production. Now, every now and then, manufacturers will commission things and bring them to the trade shows and take orders. Every now and then, the guitar never gets built because maybe there wasn't enough interest in, in that cost of it. So this could actually be a demo it could be a that never went into full production. That's right. This could have been built at D'Angelico and never got uh, in, maybe there's very few of them, if any, uh, on the market. But, you know, I just would be super surprised, like I don't see evidence of that kind of work. It all looks original to me. And, you know, I mean, usually we're pretty good at picking that kind of stuff up. The only thing I see that's a little, a little bit might be consistent with your story is that it looks like the, this little piece of wood right here appears to be mahogany. You can't see it from the outside because it's painted. Everywhere else on the side is maple and the back and sides on this guitar is entirely maple. Uh, it could be they didn't want to curve a piece of maple that much for this tight cutaway and decided to use mahogany and paint it. The paint matches perfectly. Binding matches perfectly. There's no evidence that this was ever modified. But, I mean, I could be wrong. I've been wrong. I've a, never seen a it. A few times in my life, I've been wrong. Yep. You just ask my wife. She'll let you know. So, yeah. We'll just find a picture of one. I think that's what we need to do is go on a... You need to go on and just bring up images and just scan images till you go, there it is. I've done that. Yeah, you never you know me. Yeah, well, you know. It's not there. Okay. So, you know, to me, I think there's a chance this may... I haven't done my homework. I'm listening to a lot of your, your free research you've done. If this was never in the lineup with a Florentine cutaway, then I could believe that pretty easily that this might have been a prototype or, you know, of limited production to try and show this model. I don't believe it was modified. If it was modified, I don't know anybody who could do it for that amount of money. And if you got knowledge of those kind of things, I mean, you know, then you can tell me the rest of the story. But I don't. Okay. The person I got it from. That was the story they gave you? Yeah. The story was they were trying to get down to the lower frets. Yeah. And you can see the finger well, wear down there. That's what cutaways are for. Yeah. But you can get and, to the same fret with a, any type of cutaway. And, and they said they couldn't get there. So a professor in San Diego directed them to this person. They did the work. And they paid this person $300 to do the work. So this pick guard, um, do you think that's original? Yes, it matches what the replacement parts are available from D'Angelico, okay. along with the truss rod cover and the tailpiece. So why would, then you're saying that there was a cutaway, but it wasn't deep enough? I All I know is they would not give up the name yeah. of the person who did the work other than the person's name is Angel. Well, you know we had a couple of... Guitar stores in San Diego. We know a lot of people down there. A lot of guitar types too. I'm gonna do a little more homework for you because I don't I don't think this is anything but a D'Angelico EX L1 from the day, and I think it's a beautiful guitar, it is what it is. But I'll bet you we find something that's got this. Because um, something doesn't something's fishy. You know, that's what I think. The, uh, 
Number one, this is a really hard thing to do. So anybody who does that's got a lot of skill. And anybody who's got that level of skill would probably never take that job on a guitar at this level. You know what I mean? They'd be using that skill to restore an old Gibson from the 50s or something, spend their time doing that. They wouldn't be modifying a D'Angelico, doing a job that arguably exceeds the value of the guitar. You know, that's just the truth. So the story doesn't, doesn't add up to me. And uh, the other thing is uh, that I'm just, my observation was somebody playing this for so long with these, what appear to be nine gauge strings on here and wearing the heck out of the, the frets, playing the entire fingerboard and not getting a mark on the guitar. You know, how did that happen? You see how this is dark? As they get close here, this is dark on the neck. That's how they finish off these guitars. It's not, it wouldn't be unusual for this to be blonde and then all of a sudden going to dark for this entire curve. That would be somebody's call on how we're going to do this sunburst. This is dark, everything's dark as it. So, yep, very cool, man. Okay, so, um, here's a takeaway. I heard Rob say something was very interesting to me. And it kind of goes back to something Fred touched on. Fred touched up on, touched on why the, this fretboard was used, 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 used. Played a lot, he said. Rob noticed that too, but Rob said, how does a guitar... Uh, with a neck that's used that much, end up with a body that has not a mark on it. And that got me to thinking, and I looked at this thing, and he's right. So does my mind jump to, okay, I know if you get on the D'Angelico site, you can buy the tailpiece, you can buy the pick guard, um, and these pickups are pretty easy to get. They, uh, they float on the... Uh, Pit guard is this body from something else and somebody put a neck on there I don't know um, neither one of them could say that the work that showed um, says that or that you could do it for $300 I think you you heard um, them so by this time um, I decided well you know what let's have Rob work on this thing so the first thing Rob did was went to work on the fingerboard and um, used some products and things and then shined up the body. And I used the techniques Rob used in that episode where we did the 1950 Silvertone junk pile and uh, set it up for, uh, I think it was called the $3.74 arch top uh makeover and i'll give you a link up there some of these cards now i'm using them up so fast i can't remember but anyway check that out so while i had this guitar there i had rob do a setup on it and here's what rob said the sounds uh mainly the big problem with the intonation was that there was not the right string in the, in the fourth position so a jazz box you'd have a wound string, not a straight string. So instead of an 18 plain string, you'd have 18 wound strings. So he, he went through it. It didn't take a lot of work, but he set it up. And um, again, there's questions about if the person I got it from was the accomplished guitar player that would do the neck like that. And um, there's not a scratch on the body to this day. Why did it have the wrong strings and why wasn't it in a, in, intonated properly knowing that somebody could play like that would have the right strings on? So those were the questions I went out with. Anyway, Rob set it up. It worked great. And Frank was about ready to leave town. And so I made a drive out, sat down with Frank, and he gave me um, another clip 
playing this guitar after it had been set up by Rob. Let's go look at that while I find out what those dogs are barking about. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. You've played a lot of my guitars, and um, I don't think people would understand what they are or how really <laughs> surprisingly well they play. Along those lines, um, Fred, you've always been there to help me improve the technical part of it because anybody can glue stuff on uh, a yard sale guitar and call it functional art, but you've given me a lot of pointers along the way that really helped me out and of course i share those on this channel um bill bates thank you um again being around la uh and having a groups of musicians that still play the blues is a really really handy thing um and i appreciate the help they give me and donate their time and talents to help me out so you the viewers can give me a like and a subscribe if you haven't. Um, Rob, Guitar48, you are the best. Don't forget, if you're around the LA area and get over by Ventura, Rob will see to it that he's got something for every budget, and if you improve and wanna move up in something, he's always there if you keep your stuff in good shape to give you some residual on it towards your next purchase. So, all right, Fred, Bill, Frank and Rob couldn't do it without you. I'm going to get back on straightening up my shed. I think that everybody's going to like when they see what I'm doing here and they finally learn what really my shed is made out of. It's going to be surprising. And I'll get into some details about how I got it and what I paid for it. And then some of the changes I've made and some of the workflow processes I use to do what I do. So, hey guys, thanks for watching and I will see you soon.